Oh, good morning, beloved. I greet you today in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. And I want to start by telling you that if you accomplished reading all that you were assigned, then bless your sweet darling heart. <laughs> because the assignment, oh my soul, was Exodus 5 through Exodus 28. That passage covers the plagues, the Passover, the Exodus, the wilderness wanderings, the giving of the law, and the tabernacle. Oh, my soul, I have wrestled with this lesson for two weeks trying to see what it was the Lord would have me do. Obviously, I could not teach you all of that text. Although it is my style to go verse by verse, you're going to be relieved to know that I'm setting that aside for this series. I want you to know that the handout I have given you took me seven hours, seven just to write it. Seven. Anybody get that? Seven hours just to write it. Yes, yes. I operate well with approval. You'll need to know that if you want to be my friend. But I'm just going to tell you that I kept going before the Lord, asking Him to somehow give me something more than just taking my 45 minutes to read the text. And so today, what I believe the Lord has for us is to look at the Passover in specifics. But I am reminded, as I tell you, that seven hours, you know, could we just pause for a moment of silence? Seven hours. Now, girls, you're worth that and much more. I'm just telling you that if I tried to teach a lesson that took me seven hours to write, we would be here next Tuesday this time. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes of R.G. Lee three pastors ago. Dr. Lee was pastor here at Bellevue, and he used to say when he had an unusually long message, put away your watches and get out your calendars. <laughs> so girls, I want you to know that this message has been bathed in prayer. And that I intend to get through it in the next 45, 50, 55, 60. Really, what are they going to do to me if I go over <laughs> Girls, I am free in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am. Yes, I am. And let me just say, every one of these chapters is so rich that I don't want you to think just because I don't have the, the time and the wherewithal to go through each one of them, they are not precious and perfect. Oh, my goodness. Exodus is some of the richest scripture. And one of the points of trying to take our ladies here in women's ministry through the Old Testament chronologically and through the New Testament chronologically is that you might understand that the New Testament is a continuation of the Old Testament. It is all the story of God. It is all the story of God's remedy for man's ruin. It began in the garden. And we see the first mention, the first promise of a coming Messiah, of a Savior in Genesis chapter 3. After God pronounces the judgment or in the midst of the judgment, God remembers mercy. And he promises one who was coming. And then he goes on in chapter 3 to take an innocent animal and slay the animal and clothe Adam and Eve. Now, beloved, just because the Bible pictures that we have in our mind, you're going to have to excuse me. Just thinking about seven hours made my mouth go dry. <laughs> we see Adam and Eve clothed in garments of animal skin, and we see it as very neat and tiny. Beloved, it was not. It was bloody. It was horrific. It was the first killing recorded after God had declared his creation was all good. It was painful and sorrowful, but it was a picture of the blood covenant cut between sinful man and a holy God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hate to rush through it, but in doing so, I believe what God would have us to do is look in depth at the Passover. So let's go to the throne of prayer with me, please. Oh, Father, Father, we read your word and we see Jesus all throughout it. 
And Father, we've gathered together today as women who love the Lord Jesus Christ, women who have made a claim on godliness. And Father, it is our heart's desire to come and kneel at your throne asking you to speak to every one of us through your word this morning. I ask Lord Jesus as the word of God who was made flesh and came and dwelt among us that you would speak to us, that you would magnify yourself through your word and spirit of the living God that you would be the teacher and the hearer today. Only the Spirit of God can impart truth. And I am asking, Lord, that when I open my mouth, you will fill it so that what goes forth is your word that you have promised will not return unto you void. Father, we are broken, damaged people who serve a glorious, risen Savior. And we are determined to study this book from cover to cover to take it in that we might live it out. Father, we are not after knowledge for knowledge's sake. The scripture says that puffs up. We want to know the reality of Jesus Christ so that we can walk worthy of the high calling that is ours in Jesus. That others might see the reality of Christ, that they might sense the aroma of Christ as it fragrances our life of the reality of the one that we belong to. And Father, all of the praise and all the glory is due to you this morning. And we cry out deep within our spirits, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. And Father, as we look at this glorious Old Testament picture of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, may Father, may Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, be lifted high. Father, hide me behind the cross. I must decrease in order that you would increase so that you might reveal to all of us your perfection, your holiness, your truth, your worthiness. You alone deserve our worship and our praise. So receive it today as a sweet-smelling savor of incense. We bless you and praise you. And again, Lord, I just pray that you would help me to bring a message that is impactful, that is insightful, that is accurate, and that, Father, you would allow us in these moments to see a fresh new vision of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We bless you now and we praise you. Oh God, it is our prayer to be found faithful to the finish. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all pray, amen and amen. Beloved, we are reading the Bible for life. And again, as I told you in the introduction, we're trying to help you see that all of the Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, he is the hero of the story. But many people believe he is not revealed in the New Testament, excuse me, in the Old Testament because he's not named. But beloved, we see him in pictures and imagery. Now, you and I must be very, very careful <clears throat> as we identify him through pictures in the Old Testament. We must not take those pictures too far. For instance, Joshua is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Joshua was a man with a sin nature, so he can only briefly be imagery for us of the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, that scarlet thread runs all the way through if you're looking for it. But be careful that you don't take a picture too far because it's merely a shadow of what it represents. The other problem with studying the Old Testament, in my opinion, is that it's possible to tangle up what God has said directly to the nation of Israel, what God has said directly to the church, and what God is saying to both. And beloved, you have to discern by the reading of the text in context and able to understand what those pictures are about. As you know, I've only recently re, uh, returned from uh, being on a mission trip in Africa. Craig and I were able to go with a team of Bellevue members up to a place called Moyo in the most northern part of Uganda. It is so rural and so difficult to get to that there is no Christian work going on. There had been no Christian work going on 
there until just a few years ago when our friend planted a ministry there in Moyo. Now, he has a compound. His name is Floyd Paris, and he has a compound, which is the head of his ministry when he's in country, and he's there about half the year, and the state's about half the year. Now, this compound was built by Doctors Without Borders when they were over there serving actually the Sudanese refugees who were fleeing their country and, and coming through Moyo, and that's where they were ministering. But they left after that crisis began to settle down, and they left this compound to which our friend has rented. Now this compound is in the middle of the villages. All around it are little mud huts where these people and families live in these little mud huts and right in the middle is this uh, complex and it basically is a house that is surrounded by a 14 foot wall. The only access is through heavy steel gated doors. Uh, a watchman uh, watches for us to come up. We blow the horn. He opens the door or if you're walking you knock and they open this little eye gate and look to see who you are and if you're acceptable you're allowed to come in so that's the way it looked from the outside on the inside they had built several bunk rooms for a number to accommodate a, a number of people but there were also several private rooms for those who were traveling as couples Craig and I were given a private room however we shared a bathroom and it was down the hall and uh, there was a, a, a the bathroom was here there was a shower room here and the sink was actually out in the public place it was the weirdest thing to me sometimes I'd be brushing my teeth and there'd be a man behind me shaving I told them never have I done so many private things so publicly in my whole life. But that's the way the setup was. There was a living room for us to gather. There was an outdoor kitchen and there was a uh, dining room upstairs that was open to the air. So that is basically what our compound looked like. Now Craig and I, because we were traveling as a couple, we were given one of the few private rooms that there were. Now in our room, it was very, very small. In fact, it really only had room for a, a little plastic chair and the bed. Now the bed according to American standards, was very small. Uh, we're used to a king-size bed. Furthermore, they tend in Africa to use very, very small mattresses, really only a pad about this thick. And so our room, our little bed, was just a little larger than a twin-size bed. And it was pushed against the wall and into the corner. So my side uh, was against the wall, and the foot of the bed was against the corner wall. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Okay. Now then, because malaria is horrible in most African countries, they instructed us to sleep with mosquito netting. Now, I haven't done this before, I've got to tell you. I've, uh, we always take malaria medicine, and, and so typically I don't do it, but because they specifically ask if we would do it, we did that to comply and stay under the authority of our leadership. And so we did that. Now, I've just got to tell you, if you've never slept with mosquito netting, it's a bit on the creepy side, I'm just saying. <laughs> because you are suddenly shrouded with this sheer netting all around you. Now, because our bed was small, every night I would get in first and Craig would get in last and he would spread the netting out over us and it would just it'd be like ooh, ooh. I did not do well with it now my husband just so you know does not sleep very well just one of those things that aging has caused he's a very light sleeper now he wasn't when the children were babies I'm just saying <laughs> I would get up in the middle of the night with those crying children and I would go to where my husband was laying in bed and I would lean down so those little crying babies were right in his ear. That's just how shallow I was in those days. And my husband would get up the next morning and say, oh, did the baby sleep through the night? And I'd think to myself, if I weren't so tired, I'd get up and I would hurt you for that. But they eventually slept through the night, but then Craig didn't. And uh, uh, so I try not to disturb him. Well, one particular night I woke up and I just had to get up. I had to. I tried to make myself go back to sleep and I couldn't. And I was so concerned about disturbing my husband who was in very deep sleep. The man does not snore, but I could tell by his breathing he was very, very deep in sleep. So I crawled just as carefully as I could to the foot of my bed. My plan was if I could possibly cross over over his feet without touching him, I would be able to get up, launch myself through that mosquito netting, and get out without waking him up. 
Now the plan was, it was, it took me several minutes, I want you to know, to even get up and crawl down to the foot of the bed. And I was pausing, he's still breathing very deep. I get one arm over his feet. I get the other arm over. Now I'm trying to get a leg over. And don't you know, I got tangled up in that mosquito netting. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was trussed up like a turkey before it was over with. I had netting all over me. And of course, I woke up Mr. Stockdale. Now, my application is this. You must not get tangled up. When you read the scripture, and if you don't read it carefully, you're liable to get all tangled up. Because the Old Testament speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ in type and in picture. But you want to be careful that you don't take those pictures too far. But one of the most glorious evidences of him and his redeeming power is found in the Passover lamb. Now you will recall that in uh, the first few chapters of Exodus that God sent Moses and Aaron to speak to Pharaoh. Now I I'm not going to follow by your notes. I'm just going to tell you right now, none of this is actually in your notes. You'll just want to take notes or listen quietly. I'm doing the best I can, people. I'm doing the best I can. <sighs> now, Moses at this time was 80 years old. He had spent the first 40 years of his life becoming somebody. Remember, he was raised in Pharaoh's camp. And then he spent the second 40 becoming a nobody. Remember, he ended up on the backside of the desert. And then he spent the third 40 years of his life learning what God can do with one who has learned the first and second lesson. Beloved, I believe that quote is attributed to Dwight Moody. And isn't it a good one? First 20 years learning to be somebody. First 40 years learning to be somebody. Second 40 years learning to be nobody. Third 40 years learning to be who God can use and become who's learned the first and second uh, lesson. I love that. I love that. Well, I believe it was original with Dwight L. Moody, but I discovered many, many years ago as I began to study the Word of God that there's very little, very little, that's really new. A lot of it is selective plagiarism when you read commentaries. And so Dwight probably got it from someone else. I don't know. But I have heard that the first time you repeat a quote you are to give the credit to the one who said the quote. The second time you use the quote, you begin by saying, I've heard. And the third time, you just go out ahead and say, well, as I've always said. So, a long time ago, and I mean years ago, I was uh, privileged to be at a conference speaking with Joyce Rogers. And she and I were talking together uh, in between conference times, and she mentioned someone uh, to me, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't even recognize that name. And she said, well, I've heard he uses a lot of my husband's stuff. To which I said, Joyce, <laughs> we all use your husband's stuff, amen. <laughs> you know, if that's a deal breaker, then count me in because we all use his stuff. But um, I want you to recall that God had instructed Moses and he was going to have to use Aaron because remember Moses stuttered and he was sure he couldn't speak well. And he was sending them to go to Pharaoh and to say, if you look with me in chapter 5, Exodus chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron came and they said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But what does Pharaoh say? Verse 2, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. Now, beloved, that's the point we pick up the story in, is that Moses and Aaron have gone and confronted Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, I don't know who in the world you're talking about. I don't know your God. Well, what transpired is the plagues. God sent nine plagues, ten if you count the plague of the death of the firstborn. And it happened over the course, we believe, of about a year that God was making sure that Pharaoh had an encounter with him. Now the scripture says that Pharaoh ultimately was grieved and he regretted, he regretted what he had done to the Israelites. Beloved, that's what we call a hemmed up confession. That is not repentance that leads to godliness. He was sorry he got caught. That's regret. 
And beloved, that is not the same as repentance. Repentance is when we're walking one direction and God has an encounter with us and we turn and go in the opposite direction. Godly repentance always produces a change of heart which leads to a change of direction. But God gave Pharaoh ample warning and ample time to repent of his sins and receive God and he refused in fact he hardened his heart he hardened his heart he hardened his heart and finally God just gave him up and God hardened his heart well I want you now to look with me if you would uh, to the um, Exodus chapter 12 because this uh, confrontation, this initial confrontation with Pharaoh is what sets the scene for what dominates the scripture of most of Exodus, at least through uh, chapter 15. And that is Pharaoh refusing to let the people of God go and God raining down one horrible plague after another. Now I've put that in your notes. I'm not going to try to teach that. I'm just going to say something very fascinating to me is that every one of those plagues plagues were designed to show up the corresponding God that the Egyptians were uh, worshipped. Uh, they worshipped the God of gnats, the God of the Nile, the God of the cattle, and on and on and on. They even worshipped Pharaoh. And so every one of those plagues were not random acts of God, but designed specifically to show Pharaoh and the Egyptian people that God was the one and only true God. So now come with me to um, Exodus chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt... This month, and, and by the way, we're right now on the nine plagues have been completed and we're coming up on the threshold of the killing of the firstborn. Chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. God's saying, I'm fixing to do a new thing and it's going to set a new calendar of events for you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep. Or from the goats, you shall keep it until the fourth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Well, did you see it? God told Israel that they were to take a lamb. And beloved, this is the reference, the first reference to one of the most endearing titles we have for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He is revealed to us in the Gospels as the good shepherd who cares for the sheep, the door of the sheepfold. Beloved, he is pictured all the way back here in uh, Exodus, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who would be the uh, Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. So you see the reference in the Old Testament and you see it in the New New Testament. We're trying to get you to see that you can overlay these books one on top of the other and you will see that they are complete texts of the divine revelation of God from the Old to the New Testament. So he says, take a lamb. You will recall it's in John 1 29 that John the baptizer said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A reference back to this first lamb of Passover. Look in verse 3 and 5. I want you to notice a progression. At the end of verse 3 he says take a lamb for each household. At the end of verse 4 he says divide the lamb. He went from a lamb to the lamb and then the most personal, personal of 
all is found in verse 5 when he says, your lamb. Beloved, this is not simply uh, scrutinizing the scripture because every word of God is tested and tried and we're warned not to add to it or take away from it. Every word is important, but there is a progression there. A lamb, the lamb, your lamb. There's a very personal nature in the progression of the lamb. That is the Lord Jesus Christ that cannot be just a lamb or the lamb. He has to become personal to you. You have to receive him by grace through faith personally in order for his blood to be applied to your sin debt. Now the scripture teaches in a number of places, my favorite is in 1 John chapter 2, that Jesus is the propitiation for all the sins of the world, uh, uh, the propitiation for our sins and not only ours but for the sins of the whole world. That is, Jesus died to redeem everyone. His blood was sufficient to redeem every person in the whole world. And yet, we know it is only applied to the sin debt of the individual who receives and believes by faith on the completed work of Jesus Christ. So there's this personal nature that we see tucked in to um, Exodus chapter uh, 12 and verse uh, 4, 5, and 6. He was also to be a spotless lamb. The lamb was to be a male without blemish. Again, a picture of the perfect lamb of God in whom there is no spot or blemish. First Peter refers to him in 119 as the unblemished and spotless one whose blood has redeemed us. Beloved, do you see that over and over and over again that God is speaking to, prophesying, presenting the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And here, one of the truly, truly poignant pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ as a lamb. He was to be spotless as the Lord Jesus Christ who became like us yet without sin. Beloved, he had to become a man because the estate of mankind had been given away by a man. Adam in the garden. So it had to be redeemed back by a man, but not just any man. He had to be sinless. And those qualifications are only met in Jesus Christ, who was altogether made a man in his humanity, and yet without diminishing his deity, he was altogether what we call the God man. And beloved, he had to be virgin born. He had to be without sin. Don't let that get past you. Beloved, if he had been the son of Mary and Joseph, he would have inherited uh, the sin nature, which would have been passed down all the way from Adam and Eve, yes? And he could not have died for my sin or your sin or the sins of the world. He'd have to die for his own sins. So do you see how very, very important the virgin birth is? Do you see how this picture of a lamb who was unblemished and spotless, it has to be that way to picture in type and form and shadow the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So he had to be spotless. He also was to be selected, it said, on the 10th kept by the family, observed, scrutinized by the family to make sure he indeed was perfect and spotless. And then he was to be slain between the uh, 14th and 15th day. Now, beloved, in order to check that lamb out very carefully, in order to make sure it was uh, according to God's law, spotless and without blemish, I believe each one of those families would have brought that lamb in to the household to live as a beloved pet. Now, can you imagine how attached the children would get to this baby lamb? Can you imagine every few days, or excuse me, it was only with them a few days, but can you imagine how the children especially fell in love with this darling pet? And yet, that darling pet became beloved, would have to die the sinless for the sinner. And so after the 14th, between the 14th and 15th day, the lamb, which had been set aside for death, was killed and as a picture of Christ who was tested and watched during his earthly ministry and especially uh, up to uh, the week before the cross. I'm laughing because 
when I work, I, I write at my computer, and so I spend my days sitting at my desk with my computer, and I declare the screen's gotten just about as big as my desk will hold. If anybody's aging, you understand what I'm saying. And even that, I have to bump the font up. I'm now up to 18 just to be able to read it. And uh, I printed it out on 18 font, which means, you know, I've got about 45 pages. Uh, got three words on each page. I'm just kidding about that part. But I just could not believe it when my lesson went on and on and on and on. It's because my font has gotten very, very large because my eyesight evidently has gotten very, very poor. Okay, now the lamb had to be killed. The family was not saved by the life of the lamb, but by the death. Again, a picture of Christ who was sinless without sin. He saved us by his death. The scripture teaches in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Revelation 13, 8, and this is in the King James Version, although I usually use New American. He is referred to as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's our Jesus. And so the scripture goes on to reveal the instructions that God has given to Moses and Aaron to give to the people. Verse 7, moreover... You shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. That is, blood was to be put on each doorpost and on the lintel. That's very easy for us to see that the blood formed the sign of the cross. The blood, beloved, was sufficient to cover the sin debt, but it was not applied until the family, the father of the household, killed the lamb, caught his blood in a basin, and then applied it to the household. And it's important for you and I to understand that you and I have an obligation, a responsibility to either respond and receive Jesus Christ or reject him. We must be under the blood. The uh, uh, danger of the um, angel of death was not done until the blood had been applied. So if a family had merely heard the instructions but not acted upon them, what happened? The firstborn died. It was only those who had the sign of the blood on the doorpost that the God had promised his angel would pass over. Now the blood was to be applied with hyssop. Hyssop is a very common weed all throughout Israel. It's very attainable. And I believe that is a picture of faith because it was with the hyssop that the blood was applied. In the same way, when we hear the gospel, we have a moral obligation to either receive or reject Jesus Christ. But it's available to all of us. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. He died for all of us. But the blood is not applied to our sin debt until we take the hyssop, dip it in the blood, and apply it to the doorpost of our hearts. You understand what I'm saying? It's not simply enough to hear it. It's not simply enough to nod to the facts. Yes, I believe Jesus Jesus is the Son of God, and I believe he died for sin. The Bible says in James, the demons believe that much, and it causes them to tremble. Beloved, it becomes effective in our life personally when by faith, with repentance, we receive the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart and into our lives. Then our sin debt personally has been atoned for. So there is that aspect of faith. Without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. And so here we see, I believe, a great picture of hyssop, which is available to everybody. Everybody could freely gather the hyssop. And everyone who wanted to apply the blood was able to because they took the hyssop and they dipped it in the blood and then they applied it uh, to the doorpost and lintel of the household. They acted on God's instructions just like we on this side of the cross believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ with repentance and faith. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Now, can you even imagine the, the imagery as the father 
taught the children who were in his household and led his wife to the understanding that this is what God requires of us is blood, the application of the blood. And when he sees the blood, he will pass over. Can you imagine this incredible teaching opportunity for the father, the head of the household, to teach his wife and train his children in the things of the Lord? And beloved, that was true in the Old Testament, and it is still true. The scripture teaches that the husband is the head of the wife, and he is to love Christ. He is to love his wife, rather, as Christ loves the bride of Christ, the church. And it says in Ephesians chapter 5, the mystery is great here, but I'm speaking in terms of Christ and his bride, the church. Again, a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture when Christ is the center of a marriage and of a home, how God uses that as a visual aid to the earthly kingdom to reveal how Christ loves his bride, the church. Beloved, all throughout the scripture you will see there are pictures. In fact, I believe if we had spirit eyes, we would see that everything that God created speaks back to the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal relationship with a personal Savior. It is because you and I are so busy and so spiritually dull at times that we simply don't see it. But God is declaring to the entire world, using us as actors on the stage in the theater, the arena of the life in which we live, that others might see Christ in us. Just like so many generations ago when the Father set the family down and said, Thus saith the Lord, and then continued and uh, did as he was required. Now in verse 8, through 10 look at what he says and thou shalt eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water but rather roasted with fire both its head and its legs along with its entrails and you shall not leave any of it over until the morning for whatever is left of it until the morning you shall burn with fire now the instructions were that they were not only to kill the lamb but they were to roast it with fire the fire speaks of the suffering of Christ on the cross when he drew the father's wrath when he who knew no sin became sin for us and God poured out his wrath upon his darling son on the cross that's what's pictured and the lamb must be cooked with fire so not only did they have to kill uh, the the lamb they had to apply the blood they also had to eat it and it is a picture, beloved, of us in New Testament times having partaken in salvation that we now, in this process called sanctification, must continually come back day after day after day and get a filling of the Word of God through prayer and through meditation and through Bible reading. It's the feeding on the Lord. It's the feasting on His Word that sustains us to do the work He has called us to do. And it's so interesting, he said, there's to be no leftovers salvation encompasses the whole work of Christ for us and our identification with it leftovers would spoil in that climate they would ruin and that would ruin the type of Christ for you see the scripture says it's in Psalm 16 for you will not abandon my soul to hell nor will you allow your holy one to undergo decay so it was a picture that they must consume all of the lamb and if there were any leftovers and the family simply could not eat it all they were to burn those so there would be no leftovers they were also to eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs leaven in the scripture is nearly always old and new testament a picture of sin and it is uh, uh, yeast is an incredible thing for those of you who have made bread now you young girls don't even know that there are people that actually make bread look it up on pinterest you'll see there's a lot of people that do but you have to be really savvy to handle yeast in my opinion 
Because if your yeast is old or tired and dead, you're going to go to a whole lot of work for bread that will not rise. So leaven is a picture of sin. And that is, it is insidious. When hot water is added to yeast, if it is activated, and it begins to poof up the dough. And it begins to rise the bread. And it's a picture of how sin can so easily infiltrate, so easily, insidiously, in fact, uh, the the uh, fellowship and so God says you're to eat it with unleavened bread uh, in the years to come the feast of unleavened bread is a time when the orthodox Jewish families cleanse their house of any uh, uh, anything that's dirty uh, as a picture of being clean house and body uh, before the Lord now that's probably where we get spring cleaning from by the way uh, in case any of you uh, feel like you're uh, obligated to do that that's where that comes from some of us have been set free I'm just saying <laughs> the, yes yes Jane the, uh, the older I get the less I care about what my house looks like I'm just saying uh, and the more it just is it just is what it is that's the uh, that's one of our phrases between Craig and I it is what it is uh, because well, I'm not, I just have to save that for another day. But anyways, um, that's probably where that came from. And it was to be eaten with bitter herbs. That was to remind the Israelites of the bitter cup that Christ would drink. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane that he said, Father, if there's any way this cup of bitter herbs, basically, this cup of bitterness could pass away from me, then please let it. But then he con concludes it by saying, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's a picture of, of bitter herbs. Not only that, it says that they were to be ready, dressed and ready for travel. Look in verse 11. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins gathered, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will go through, this is God speaking, the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Did you see it in verse 11? You're to be dressed and ready to travel. They were to eat the uh, uh, food in haste because they were soon going to be leaving Egypt. Beloved, for us in New Testament, I believe it's a picture that you and I are to be ready at a moment's notice. That when God calls us into service, that we are ready to go. That we have on the full armor of God. That we are standing with our staff and our hands standing so that we can move in any direction he calls us to. The Bible says to walk Walk worthy of your high calling in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible teaches that we are to be ready at any moment to give an answer of the hope that is within us. And I believe we see that in picture form here all the way back in Exodus uh, chapter 12. Be ready, be dressed, be ready to go. God's about to move. It took faith that night to be delivered the Egyptians thought all of these things must have been such foolishness. Can you imagine how they mocked and laughed as the Israelites were preparing for Passover? It was foolishness to them, and that speaks to us of the New Testament that says these things are spiritually discerned. That's why an unbeliever acts the way they do. They cannot possibly understand the role of Jesus Christ in our life and the Spirit of God that lives within us. Those things are spiritually discerned. We must have the Spirit of God dwelling within us in order to impart the truth to us. And so the Egyptians, the unbelieving, they think the things we do are absolute foolishness. And I don't know if there's ever been a time the church of Jesus Christ is being more mocked in the media and the political arena than it is right now. And beloved, that is because they know not the one of whom we love and adore. Because if they did, beloved, if they did, they would honor him in their innermost being and by an example of their life. Well, look with me now in verse 29 and uh, verse 30. 
of the same chapter. And it says, Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captives who were in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh arose in the night. He and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, there was a great cry in Egypt for there was no home where there was not someone dead that is among those who did not believe and act on faith. But for Israel, for those who had applied the blood, the, pass, the angel of death passed over uh, them. Can you imagine what a contrast we see in the home of the Israelites, the ones who believed God and obeyed God? Can you imagine the feasting and rejoicing? And in the homes of the unbelieving the homes of the Egyptians from Pharaoh uh, at the highest who must have surely thought he had enough guards, armed guards. Perhaps even that night he had more armed guards around his firstborn, believing that nothing could touch him. And yet from Pharaoh all the way down, those who had not acted uh, as God had given instructions to Israel, there was someone in their home that had died. What a, what a desperate cry of mourning must have gone out. Can you even imagine and yet for the Israelites, the very thing that sealed the doom of the Egyptians was the very thing that God was going to use for deliverance in their life. It reminded me of this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 that says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. I love that imagery of Christ the cornerstone. This precious value then is for you who believe. To us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the cornerstone upon which we have built a life of faith and good works. But for those who disbelieve, that same stone he's talking about, the stone which the building builders rejected, that became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they're disobedient to the word and this doom has been appointed to them. Do you get that? Christ has made to us the choice cornerstone of our faith. And to the unbeliever, this same precious stone has become a stumbling stone to them because they refuse Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, Romans chapter 1 teaches that everyone is guilty before God because he has declared himself in his creation. All of creation speaks of him. And there is none who is going to be able to say, I did not know. Because God has declared who he is for all to receive. And yet there are those who will continue in darkness and blindness and reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And to those, this will become not the chief cornerstone, but the stumbling stone, the rock of offense. Well, I'm going to have to wrap this up. But after uh, that night when the terrible uh, crisis had happened in Egypt, when uh, the, the death angel had passed through and, and the Egyptians and all those who had not obeyed God uh, suffered loss and the... Um, Children of Israel, however, were uh, swept away out of Egypt. And it says that they camped there beside the Red Sea and they looked behind them. Now, we think probably three million people went out, if you can even imagine. Uh, mamas, don't sometimes your own little flock get so badly on your nerves? Can you even imagine trying to guide and guard the flock of God? Oh, my soul. Millions of people, many of them little children. And, and, and so they had come up as far as they could go to the Red Sea. And they looked behind them and here was Pharaoh's armies. Pharaoh's armies were coming up and they were very afraid. And it says that all throughout the night God kept the armies from being able to encroach upon a God's people. And again it points to the fact as we saw in Job that God is the one who sets the parameters for which Satan can attack our lives. But we see that God has protected them. The Egyptians here and the uh, Israelites here and the Red Sea there. And now they're scared and they're frightened and they're murmuring and they're complaining. And, and, and uh, God tells them to, uh, uh, to uh, patiently wait and to watch and to see that he will fight the battle for them. And throughout the night it says a wind began, a very strong wind began to blow. And I'm certain that brought even more fear to the Israelites. And yet that very wind that blew through was what God used to open up the Red Sea. And the Israelites walked through on dry ground. 
Now, if you have a boy and you raised a boy, was your son, can you not imagine your son being the one closest to the water doing his hand like this? I've always wondered. Uh, there were some who raced across fearful. There were some who played across uh, the little ones. And then there were some who walked with their face set like a flint uh, towards the salvation of the Lord. And just as Israel was safely delivered on the other side, God caused the Red Sea to close to up and all of the Egyptian army was destroyed. Beloved, this set up what should have been the most incredible account of obedience in the whole scripture, but we know that this set up the beginning of what is called the wandering of the wilderness. And what should have been a trip they could have made 11 days, 15 days, at the most a month, took them 40 years and they wandered in the wilderness. So it's a warning to us that our God is faithful, but our God requires obedience, not just to enter into salvation, but then to walk in the fullness of Christ through the process of sanctification. Uh, several weeks ago, as you know, I returned from um, Africa and uh, the jet lag... On that trip, it took us 36 hours of travel to get back home. And the jet lag is just unbelievable. But that's not the part that really destroys Craig and I. It is the emotional impact and the spiritual uh, implications of being in a third world country has on us. That we cannot let it go. It takes weeks for both of us to process out what we have seen. Trying to see what God would have us retain. And what would God have us push to the side. What would God would have us act upon and learn from and uh, what of that trip was to be uh, set aside. It's very, very painful and very difficult, but both of us, both of us try not to rush through that, knowing that God allowed us to go for some higher purpose than to go and teach uh, the Afghan uh, uh, teachers and a uh, pastor's wife. There's a higher purpose in that. That's what we did for the ministry to them. But beloved, he intended to do a great work in our life as well. He does that on mission trips. But I've just got to tell you, both of us have to be prepared for the fact that the recovery is not going to be pretty. And it really is not. I sleep when I should be awake and I'm awake when I should be asleep. And for usually about two weeks, the two of us eat cereal. Because I cannot pull myself together to go to the grocery store and get my act together. I just have to, every time the meal rolls around, I've no more thought about that than anything. Because for all that time of the mission trip, I've not thought about any of the mundane things that are part of my responsibility, like doing laundry, making beds, and, and preparing meals. And so I'm just so out of sorts. It's just, it's comical. It really is. My husband's such a, as you know, I've, I've spoken of him. He's, he's a, a, such a laid-back personality. And so uh, he's able to just uh, tolerate me, is all I can say, uh, for those weeks when I come back. Well, my dear friend Renee Terrell, who's not here today, uh, but uh, she's out of town with her husband, but uh, Renee uh, usually gives me a good week without even contacting me or beginning to talk to me about ministry. But after that, there's usually ministry things that um, I need to be aware of, and she sort of helps pull me back into my reality. So on this particular trip, she gave me my week, week, week and a half, and called and said, how about we go out to lunch today? And she knows that's one of the ways as I talk through some of the things I've seen in done that I begin to process this and I said that sounds like a great idea and she said I don't need anything let's just go uh, to have lunch and let's just visit and catch up I said that'd be great so uh, you know that I live south of Somerville I live out so far that I do not have cell service on my driveway that's how far out I live. They will not deliver a pizza to where I live. That's how far out I live. And because if they did, don't you know, for those two weeks instead of cereal, we'd be eating pizza. But I, I'm just saying. So um, I, I said to Renee, where shall we go and eat? And she said, how about Slingshot Charlie's? Now, I don't know if you've eaten there yet, but you simply must mark this down as something you're going to do. Because the food is fabulous. It is fabulous. And it's all homemade, home-style vegetables and fried fish. Oh, my soul. And so I said, that sounds wonderful. She said, do you remember how to get there? Well, because I'm so jet-lagged, I told her no, but I will put it in my GPS on my phone, and I'll see you there in a while. So I look at my phone. Now, from my house to the church, it's almost an hour's drive. So when I tell you I live in the country, I'm talking about in the way, way, way out there in the country. So I put in a Slingshot Charlie's. It's in, I believe it's in Arlington proper. If not, it's on one of the edges. But you look it up and you go, I'm not kidding. You and your husband will be so blessed. And so uh, I put that in and it says to me 32 minutes. 
So I tell my husband, this is not the way I usually go. I can't remember how I go, but this isn't it. And he said, well, baby, if it says that's the quickest route, I'd advise you to go with the phone. It'll take you 32 minutes. And I, um, I said, do you remember how we've gone before that back way? And he said, oh, I'm too afraid to give you those directions. Go with what your phone says. So I get in my car, and I actually I'm in my husband's truck, and so I'm, which is so big, y'all, it doesn't really fit between the lanes. I, I just feel like I'm hanging over here and hanging over here. When someone comes uh, towards me, which doesn't happen often in the country, I will pull way over here, sometimes even stop and just let them work their way past me. But anyways, great big four-wheel drive truck. And so I'm in his truck, and I'm driving, and I've got to tell you, my mind is somewhere. And frankly, it's somewhere in Africa. I'm still over there working through those memories, the things I've seen, the people I've met. Uh, when can we go back? What are we supposed to do? All of those things, that's what I'm working through in my mind as I'm silently driving and my phone is telling me which turns to take. So I'm now not too terribly far from Slingshot Charlie when I realized there's a white pickup truck in front of me. Well, Renee's husband has a white pickup. And I thought to myself, oh, my soul, there's Renee. There's my friend. I just follow my friend. And so I'm just driving along. <laughs> it's not what you think, following my friend. And then I come to what I recall was the turn I was supposed to make. When my friend in the white truck did not make the turn, I convinced myself that wasn't Renee. And it was. <laughs> so I make this turn, and if you've used your GPS, you know that if you go off grid, it begins to uh, just get worries. Siri just, she just goes crazy. Well, as I am processing this, I am not looking at my phone because I'm sure this is the way to go. And so finally, I'm going and I'm thinking, man, I'm not sure if this is right or not. And I pick my phone up and it's already recalculated. I didn't know that. But now it says I got 19 minutes to get there. And I thought to myself, I've done something terribly wrong because I thought I was very close. But Renee, that obviously wasn't Renee, and she didn't turn. And, well, I was too afraid to turn back because now I'm in a very, very rural part of Fayette County. I am what we call wandering in the wilderness. <laughs> and I cannot find my way. And so finally I just I, I do whatever this tells me to, but I'm going farther and farther and farther and farther. And Nancy Clark, if you're in here, I went past your house and I went farther and farther. And pretty soon I'm in Brayton, Brayton, Tennessee. And I'm thinking, oh, my, I, something awful has happened. But anyways, I finally get back. It takes me 20 minutes from the time I've seen my friend to actually get into the restaurant. When I open the door, she starts dying laughing. She said, where have you been? I said, well, I thought I saw you. And she said, that was me. And I said, well, I turned. She said, why? Why did you turn? And I said, well, I thought it was supposed to. And she said, your GPS didn't correct you. I said, well, not until it was too late. And the next thing you know, I, was, I, I went a long ways. And she said, I know. Oh, I've been here for 15 minutes. And she said, I want to show you at what point you made that turn. Y'all, I could have walked. If I had just stayed on that path, I could have walked to Slingshot Charlie's. But oh, no, I was quite confident trusting in my own intellect, my own logic, my own jet-lagged, boggy brain that I knew better than GPS. Now, beloved, that's a weak illustration but one nonetheless we are not called to wander in the wilderness we are called to receive Jesus Christ by faith and repentance and then to walk in the fullness of Christ ever ready to give up an account of the hope that is within us in season out of season when we feel like it and when we don't to be ready to testify Jesus Christ alone saves Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for our time together, and I pray you would bless these precious women as we study through the Scripture, and that you would continue to reveal yourself to us, especially in the Old Testament, that over and over again you might reinforce to us that you have always had a plan, that Jesus has always been before the foundation of the world, your remedy for what you knew would happen in the Garden of Eden. Thank you so much for the blood. Thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ which washes, us away, washes away our sin. May we be found faithful as we walk in your fullness and as we live to honor and serve you. That is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you and I'll see you next week.